So good morning again. Today we're going to study torque control of DC motors. In the last lecture, we looked at speed and position control of DC motors. And today you're going to basically redo the analysis we did in the last lecture. We're going to apply it to torque control and see some more considerations that we need when implementing discrete controllers, such as integrator, wind up and other considerations in general uh, when you implement a DC motor, for example, a DC motor torque control, for example, how do you measure the torque or current and do a closed loop control with that instead of actually measuring the physical torque being uh, developed in the motor. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to analyze the closed loop torque control of a DC motor and analyze the influence of motor parameters on the frequency response. Again, in the same way we did for speed and position control in the last lecture. Here I have a few examples of uh, force control. You have this one on your copy. It's not showing here for some reason, but if you look at your PDF, you should see two robotic hands that are holding or grasping an object. If you design a controller to, for, for grasping, we are likely doing force control. That is, we want to grasp an object and ensure that the object doesn't move. We can do position control if the shape of the object is unknown and if the viscous friction coefficient between the hand and the object is also unknown. However, we can ensure that the object is, uh, the, the hand is able to grasp any object provided that it always applies a given amount of force to that object in a way that it doesn't damage the object. So instead of doing position or speed control, we could look at force control instead. We need a way to measure the force the system is applying to the object and then do a closed loop control to ensure that that force remains constant and doesn't exceed a certain threshold. Here is another example. This shows better in your slides as well. And this example here, and something you're currently working on for COVID-19, it's a system to take ultrasound images and ensure good ultrasound images, regardless of uh, the skill level of the operator. The idea when you take ultrasound images is to ensure that there is sufficient contact, acoustic contact between the ultrasound probe and the object or the, uh, the tissue you're trying to image. So you must apply a certain pressure. If you apply the pressure uh, that's too strong, then you deform the tissue. If the pressure is not sufficient, then uh, you don't get good images. How can you develop a system here that ensures that this force between the ultrasound probe and the tissue is always constant? Here is one example that the, the authors in this paper developed. There is this handheld system that has a mechanism that is able to move the ultrasound probe and there is a force sensor inside. So if you apply the force, uh, if you put the force, the ultrasound probe on top of the tissue and apply too much force, then the mechanism will make the ultrasound probe move back to adjust the force. If the force is not enough, then the mechanism moves the, the ultrasound probe towards the tissue and increases the pressure to ensure that a death force requirement is met. We are trying to do something similar in the lab, but using a robotic manipulator instead. So an example uh, of this is if you want to take images of the lung, as the chest moves, we want that out, the ultrasound probe to move with the lung, with the chest, and always maintain the same pressure, the same force between the, uh, the chest and the ultrasound probe, so the images are consistent. As another example of force control, but there are many more as you can, uh, you can imagine, especially in the industry. So let's get right into it. We started this analysis in lecture 12, then lecture 13. Oh, sorry, lecture 13 and then lecture 14. Let's go over this one more time. We have a DC motor here that is modeled with this electromechanical system. It has two main parts, the electrical and the mechanical part. We can write two equations, one to describe the electrical, one to, to describe the mechanical part. And here they are. The first one is simply a voltage balance in this loop. Uh, and you see that here we have the back EMF, which links the mechanical part and the electrical part. If we isolate for the current, this is the current developed in the armature. And you see that is a function of the input voltage, the speed of the motor, and some other parameters. We can also write the same expression now, but for the mechanical part and balance all the torques and inertia in the mechanical part. And you see that here we have this torque 
is the torque applied by the motor, by the electrical part to the mechanical part, and that connects again the mechanical and the electrical part. And here we simply have a sum of all torques and an external torque that we are driving here is considering we are considering to be the load. When you solve for the speed, we see what affects the speed. We have uh, the input torque, the mechanical characteristics of the motor, and the disturbance torque itself. All right, so under steady state conditions, when the motor reaches a certain speed, we can assume that all transients are gone. And we'll, the way we did that was just to neglect by neglecting this S here. So this S goes to zero, and that S goes to zero. And then you solve for, under steady state conditions, we solved for two variables, the speed and the torque. Because that's where, when you design something, those are the requirements we have to drive a certain load right, or to apply this torque to drive this load at this specific speed. And we're just combining the two equations above. So we came to these two equations that are, again, very useful to determine the operating conditions of the motor and to determine the graphs that we have here. We, the first one on the left gives the torque and the speed uh, with respect to the applied voltage. And you see that as the voltage increases this way, the uh, relation between torque and speed also increases. It's uh, still linear, but you can see that the more voltage, the more the higher the speed is for a given torque and vice versa. From this graph, we can conclude that as the speed increases, the torque decreases. Why is that, does that happen? Again, it has to do with the fact of a back EMF. You remember that the current developed in the motor is the voltage applied to it minus the, the EMF divided by the resistance. And the torque would be simply this times the torque constant. So if you increase the speed, the back EMF, which is proportional to the speed, decrease, increases, which means that the relative difference between V and E also decreases and the current decreases, so the torque also decreases. What else did you can infer from this graph? Well, we can infer the operating points. If we go at a very low speed, you see that the torque starts to increase and reaches its maximum when there is no, uh, no speed, that makes sense. You know, there is no back EMF counteracting the input voltage, so the current reaches its maximum. And that's what we call the stall torque, the torque when the speed is zero. This is not to be confused with the nominal torque. The nominal torque is the torque at a given speed, at a speed range. This is the stall torque, and in most cases, it cannot be sustained for more than a few milliseconds because the winding is not designed for it. The electronics are, that you have are probably not designed for it, and it's just there because of the intrinsics of how a DC motor works, but it's not the nominal torque. To find the nominal operating range, we can take this graph one step ahead and now plot the speed and the power. And again, for different levels of voltage, as the voltage increases that way. And when you look at the data sheet from a motor, when you buy it, it will specify, let's say if this random region here, this random region would be the nominal operating condition when you can let the, the motor run for extended periods of time. And it may or may not also include other areas, let's say this one, I don't know, or that one, where you can uh, operate for a limited amount of time and areas where operating operation is not recommended at all. Okay, so this is how we came up with this graph. And the reason I'm insisting with this graph one more time is that again, if you buy a good motor, a good DC motor, you will see these graphs there. You have all the information you need to uh, properly choose the motor for your application. Now let's assume that this motor is again in a steady state. It has no load. So TD, the disturbance torque or the load torque is set to zero and there is friction. If there is friction, we concluded that there is a current and this current is opposing the effect of viscous friction. What is the friction? Well, if it runs, if it has a viscous friction B and it runs at a speed omega, then the developed torque is B times omega. That's the torque from friction. As it rotates at a speed, that's the frictional torque that now the motor itself needs to overcome. So to overcome that, it needs to develop a torque. And that torque 
is simply the current times the, cons the, tor the torque constant Ki. And this will match. Right? They will match. The no load current, when you so just turn the motor on, you will see that there is a current going in. That current is there to provide a torque to simply balance the effect of friction. And that current, uh, this equation still holds, is the same one we had before, uh, where omega Km is the back EMF. And because now there must be a current to overcome that friction, we can conclude that these two values here, the back EMF and the voltage are different with the input voltage being smaller than the back EMF, and hence there is a current flowing. Once again, this current flows in the armature to develop a torque that eventually balances the effect of viscous friction. So what limits the no load speed? Well, what limits the no load speed is one, the input voltage, and no load and to the coefficient of viscous friction. That limit limits the maximum speed the motor can reach without any load. And now if we call T uh, the no load torque T0, then the no load current is simply T0 divided by the current constant, sorry, the torque constant Ki. Okay, so this is nothing new here. It's from the last lecture, just as a reminder. Now let's look at the respective transfer functions for position and speed control. This is the block diagram for a DC motor that we have used many times. And you can look at position and speed control. If you look at the speed, we need the speed transfer function between the input voltage and the output speed right there. All right, so we rearrange the block diagram using the effect of superposition, we set TD to zero. And once you solve that, we get equation one, which is the speed to voltage transfer function. Nothing new, this equation is very familiar to you uh, after all labs and control systems, I, I, I hope so. What is the position to voltage transfer function? Well, just integrate that transfer function and that becomes position to speed and you see the added integrator here, Integ integrates everything. All right, so now let's do torque to voltage transfer function, the applied torque or developed torque by the motor. So let's take this example here, this block diagram, where is the developed torque by the motor? It's right there. This is the, the torque developed by the motor. You see that the current is here. Now the, the current times K, uh, Ki is Ti, that's the developed torque by the motor. What is the stall torque? What is the equation for the stall torque here? Any ideas? How would you calculate the stall torque? Nobody? Let the speed equal zero. Exactly. In that case, the speed equals zero. So if the speed equals to zero here, this feedback is also zero. So what do you have left? In steady state, the inductor provides uh, no resistance to current. So what is the current? There is no back EMF. So the feedback is zero. The current becomes V over R, becomes V over R, and the torque becomes the current times Ki. Uh, this would be the stall torque. Once again, at no load, uh, sorry, at no speed, the feedback loop disappears for that moment. In the steady state, we have V over R, that's the current, and times Ki, that gives the stall torque. Once the motor starts to rotate, now the feedback loop activates because it's no longer zero and now the current decreases. So the torque is right there. Now, if you want the transfer function between the voltage and torque, let's rearrange the block diagram. You see now the torque appearing here, at the same position as before. And now we rearrange to have that as the output. And let's calculate the torque transfer function. We set again the disturbance torque to zero. This is the torque developed by the motor. We have a line function here. We have a feedback function there. We know how to do a block diagram, uh, transfer function for this block diagram. 
line function divided by one plus line function times feedback function. And that's what we get. That's what you get. Ki times Js plus B divided by the, the denominator there, which is very similar to the transfer function for speed here. You see that speed is the same, but it doesn't have the Js plus B. So you can say that this transfer function is the speed transfer function times Js plus B. And the speed transfer function times Js plus B, which is equivalent to saying that if you take the torque transfer function, pass that through a low pass filter, which is one over Js plus B, if you multiply this, we get the speed transfer function. We get the speed transfer function. This makes perfect sense because you're passing the system through a an, another cutoff frequency and you're bringing in now the effects of inertia to the system and friction. Right? Whereas here we have already the torque. So you're adding a cutoff frequency to go from the torque to speed. So this is S of S. So speed transfer function times Gs plus B. Let's do the steady state analysis for this case as well. For this case, then J goes to zero, Js goes to zero, and Ls goes to zero. A steady state. That's the steady state torque developed in the motor, which is the current, simply the current times Ki. We can verify that from this equation here. When Td goes to zero, that's zero. And if we divide both sides of this equation by Ki, this Ki and that Ki cancel and T over Ki is I of S. All right, so this is the torque. We divide both sides by Ki. We get the current in the steady state for this specific scenario. Or again, the same equation you had before, but now with the top term there, that goes to zero. Now let's do the load torque with respect to uh, input voltage. And the load torque is simply Ls plus R divided by the same denominator we had before. And to find a load torque again, set the input torque to zero now, sorry, set the input voltage to zero and so for the disturbance torque by rearranging the transfer function. So that should be uh, what we have here. We have Ki, we have S of S divided by Ki times Ls plus R. If you relate this to the speed transfer function, and you see the appearance here of the torque constant and another cutoff frequency that you will have to remove if you want to go from disturbance torque to position. Okay, so this is the second transfer function, and we need both because you have a system that is linear and you can apply, apply the principles of superposition to solve for the final speed or the final uh, current. In a steady state, we set all S's to zero. This goes to zero, that goes to zero. This one also goes to zero. And here is the result. This is the steady state speed given a input disturbance torque or load torque TD. Okay. So it's the same analysis we did in the last lecture, but now the focus is the torque itself developing the motor rather than position or speed. And here is the body plot for both responses for speed and for torque response. Which one is the torque response? Which one is the speed response? We have either torque over V of S input, the, the, the voltage to the motor, or speed to voltage. Which one is which? Uh, speed is orange. The speed is orange. Speed is orange. Why, why, why do you say that? Why would the speed be orange? Uh, because of the flat 
uh, magnitude at the top. Yeah, well, good, good. But we also have the flat magnitude for the other one at low frequencies here. As it could, it, it could also be the blue uh, based on that analysis, but it's a good point. It's flat, so we know that there is no integrator, uh, but that would be the way we distinguished before is speed and position. Now we are trying to distinguish speed and torque. So in fact, I see where you're coming from, but in fact, we have the opposite torque would be the orange speed would be the blue. Why is that? Well, we can see the additional cutoff frequency showing up here. Let's think about it. The first one, we are doing torque to uh, voltage. How do we go from torque to voltage? How many cutoff frequencies we need to pass through? We need only to pass through the electrical cutoff frequency, LS plus R. Because once you apply a voltage, we develop a current. We multiply that current by a constant, we get the torque. One cutoff frequency, there, that's what it is. Now let's see the second case. The second case, we want to go from speed to voltage. How do we go from voltage all the way to speed? We need to overcome the same cutoff frequency to develop a current first. Right? One cutoff frequency, voltage to current, LS plus R. And then develop a current, multiply that by the torque constant, gives a torque. Now to go from torque to speed, we have another cutoff frequency because now we need to overcome the effect of inertia and friction, Js plus B. That's the second cutoff frequency. And you see the second cutoff frequency showing there. So this is the first, there's another one there. All right, so that's the way we could distinguish them. So the one with uh, two cutoff frequencies is the speed. The one with one cutoff frequency is a torque because you're going straight from torque to speed, so for, from voltage to, to torque. Right? So the, we don't need to pass through the mechanical uh, you know, the, the mechanical cutoff frequency. And why do we care about the frequency response? Again, if you buy a good motor, this um, graph should be included, it tells you at a which range of frequencies you can have a meaningful output in your uh, in your system. Let's say you want a magnitude at a given frequency, you want your magnitude speed to, to flip this, you want to flip the speed, let's say at five, at a, let's say 100 Hertz, you want to flip the speed and you want the maximum speed to reach a certain value. The higher the frequency for a given input voltage, the lower that a maximum value is. So the only way to account for that is to start to increase the input voltage. Okay. So that relation between the input and the output at a given frequency is all available here. Uh, and tells you the effect of the electrical and the mechanical part on the frequency response of the DC mode. All right, so now let's take the torque response the equation we had, uh, sorry, the graph we had before, which is right here. This is the black one is the same graph we had before. And now let's multiply different components of this transfer function by a factor of 20 and see what happens. So we are looking at the torque to voltage transfer function. We multiply one Fact one element in that transfer function by 20 and plot the result on the result here. We see that the only thing that increases the gain is the torque constant. Everything else will decrease the gain or have virtually no effect. Right. So again, to develop, and that makes perfect sense. If you want to increase the torque, we need a higher torque constant so that it would increase the gain. Increasing the gain means less input voltage required to achieve a certain torque. All other, uh, elements, we have little impact on the torque output. Okay. All right. So that's the that's that for the body plot. I think this is in fact the only the only information we have here. Everything else, if we increase, will dec will uh, decrease the gain or shift the cutoff frequencies. Uh, for example, the inductance, the inertia is clearly visible here. If you increase the inertia, I will shift the zero cutoff frequency. If we shift the uh, 
uh, if you change the uh, speed constants also decreases the gain at low frequency. So it all makes perfect sense. All right, so for a good motor, well, this is what we need to maximize. Okay, so now let's move on to torque control. So in the last lecture, we used the very same schematic here to, to go or to develop speed or position control. And now let's do the same. Now, something that I wanted to make sure that you, you get it clearly is that this corresponds to the closed loop control. And when we talk about open loop control in a DC motor, we are talking about this response. I see this confusion happening very often. So don't make that mistake. So this is that and K omega. If we use the top block diagram, that will give us the open loop response, despite the fact that there, there is a feedback loop. This feedback loop is not part of any controller. It's part of how the motor works. So, and I see that confusion all the time. This entire diagram here is the motor transfer function. If you want to develop a feedback control for either position torque or speed, we need to take this entire system and put that into a feedback control loop. If you want to do a proportional controller, the proportional controller would be somewhere like that. And let's say we want to do a speed control. We would take the speed from here yeah, and this becomes the desired speed, and this is the proportional control. All right. This would be the closed loop speed control. Open loop speed control means we apply V of S and see what is in the output. All right. So don't get these two concepts mixed up. Open loop means the motor only, that's the blue part with its feedback loop. Closed loop means the loop that we added on top of that and where we treat the motor as the plant to be controlled. So let's see how we implement that. Here we have three elements. We have the motor, which is that entire blue part we just talked about. That's the input. The output in this case is the torque. So we have to rearrange that block diagram slightly. We measure the torque with a torque sensor or, or the current. We could measure the current. We send the torque error to a controller. The controller powers an H bridge that here is modeled as a low pass filter. The inputs to the bridge are, again, two signals. First, we need to determine the duty cycle of the bridge that goes from zero to one. And second, we need to determine in which direction we want the H bridge to apply the voltage, positive or negative. And that depends on the sign of the controller output. If the controller output is positive, we want the voltage to go one way. If it's negative, it goes the other way. So now we need to do this mapping from the controller magnitude, we'll map that to K, the controller output sign, then we'll match that to the direction. Right? One leg of the H bridge or the other, sorry, well not one leg, one way to apply the voltage to the H bridge or the other. If our controller is a, a PID controller, here is the equation for the PID controller, KD times, uh, uh, KD times KIS should be, sorry, KG. What is it? Oh, I see. So we have K proportional times KDS plus KI over S. And this would be the sum of all these three elements is the control effort that will be mapped to K. The sign will be matched to the direction. So really nothing new here. The only difference is the output that we are considering is T of S. So if we implement this, we would need a torque sensor and measuring a torque is relatively expensive, especially for something that rotates all the time. It's not a static. A torque sensor, a one dot torque sensor, a good one is in the range of three, $4,000. It's very expensive. According to our analysis, we determined that the torque is proportional to the current. So if you know the torque constant, and if you know the current, we can infer the torque from current measurements. That would be a lot cheaper and easier to implement. You can buy um, 
of current sensor for a few dollars. So here is what we could do instead. Instead of looking at the physical mechanical torque and measure that, we look at how much current the motor is deploying and we multiply that by Ki, that gives us the actual torque. So we go on with a force uh, uh, current sensor in the motor, we take the current here. This is the current being measured, uh, I of S. If you multiply the current by Ki, we have the torque developed in the motor. And now we can create the air or the feedback that way. If our torque, if the desired torque is TR, now we need to convert that into a, uh, we need to convert that into current as well. I think this feedback loop is a bit misleading. Let's actually just do this directly to avoid any ambiguity. Let's remove this feedback gain here. Let's bypass that like that. And let's assume that this is the current we measure. I think this makes more sense. Right? Well, I don't, uh, it's hard to justify why that gain would be there. Let's, yeah, let's put it this way. So we measure the current directly and this is the feedback we have. Now, if you want to create to do torque control, now what you are doing, if you see the comparison here, we're actually creating a current error and you're actually doing current control. How do you go now from torque to current? Well, if we want to apply TR Newton meters, if we divide this by Ki, this gives the required current that we need to have in the motor to develop that given torque. So now our input could be the desired torque, here it is. But because now our feedback loop is with respect to current, we first need to divide that by Ki, by the current constant, and that gives us the desired current, IR, that is required to apply TR. And now the feedback loop regulates the magnitude of the current. Okay. Typically the way we measure the, the, um, the current is with a shunt resistor. And in this example here, we have uh, the system that powers the motor and regulates, regulates the, um, the voltage. And uh, what you do typically is to put a resistance in series with the motor. So if you have the motor winding there, we apply the one, one wire of the motor goes like that. The other one comes out and goes to the ground, but we call it before it goes to the ground or back to the H bridge, we add a resistor there. And you're going to look at the voltage drop across this resistor. If there is a current flowing this way, we can measure the voltage drop here, V. It's, it's an easy implementation. And what is the voltage drop there? Uh, well, that's something we measure. So what is the current? The current would be V over RM. Or that a shunt resistor that we added there. Typically this shunt resistor, it has a resistance that is a lot smaller than the motor's resistance itself. And so it doesn't affect the motor, motor's performance in a significant way. We can measure this voltage drop. And now what is the torque? Well, the torque is V over RM times the torque constant, right? This is current times torque constant. Right? It's easy, easy to implement. Um, I don't know if you, if you got, a, did you get a current sensor for your labs this year? No? Yeah. You did? Yeah. yeah so. Yeah, so that's probably uh, what you are going to implement or already implemented there as a way to bypass the use of a mechanical uh, torque sensor, a physical torque sensor, you measure the current instead. Okay, and this way we do position control, a torque control. Any questions so far? I have a question. Yeah. If we put one over Ki in that feedback loop, would that diagram make sense? Yeah, yeah, it would. So we, we would have to do this then. Uh, it would need to take the feedback loop from here, right? Take it from there. So this would disappear here. And then we could do indeed one over Ki. 
How come we can't take it from the motor, like the T of S? Well, well uh, because the, the, that's the output. It's just a representation, just to avoid ambiguity. Oh. The reason I'm taking it, from, it taking from the motor now is because it's a different value. It's a different variable that I'm reading. I'm reading a different variable. Okay, thank you. Right. Any other questions? No? All right, so now let's look at torque control. And again, we are going to look at a PID controller. So remember that when we say torque control, we say closed loop control. So the, here is the controller. And here we have the motor transfer function, whatever motor transfer function we are, we are dealing with. And this motor transfer function, one more time, has all its feedback loops, all the back EMF feedback loop. That's the entire block diagram for the, for the DC motor or the transfer function. Let's just start with a proportional controller. With a proportional controller, C of S is just KP. We set KI and KD to zero, and this is what we have. Open loop is the same open loop response we had before for the, 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 the uh, torque. And the closed loop is the one with the it is, uh, additional feedback loop implemented. What you see here, for a closed loop, the gain is improved. No, that makes sense. No, the, we are being more aggressive with the amount of voltage we apply to develop a given torque. And this additional gain that is in the controller, when you see that we added a gain in the controller with Kp equals to 10, shifts everything upwards. So that improves the torque response. If we look at the root locus, we see the root locus here that uh, shows the system as it's always stable with no overshoot. And we see the Nyquist plot also telling us the same story, but now in terms of stability, this system is always stable, always closed loop state. So the system is always stable, adding a proportional controller helps with the torque response. No overshoot, everything is good. So what is the upper limit for KP? What are limits KP? What are limits the value of this proportional controller? Uh, when the plot gain gets big enough to encircle negative one? Uh, yes, yes, but no notice something that as we increase Kp, the, the Nyquist plot, th this is the, I don't know if this is visible, this is the real axis, the imaginary axis, sorry, as we increase Kp, it just expands to the, to the right. So we'll never encircle negative one, right? So the system is always stable in that regard. It's not expanding to the left. This is zero, right? Zero remains at zero, it doesn't move. The, the, everything else will shift to the left, the right. So stability, we are fine. Right? But indeed, if the, the motive Nyquist plot was expanding the other way, it would have an upper limit. So it's not a stability. So what is it? What are, what are limits KP? Theoretically, Voltage. there is no limit. Yeah, go ahead. Voltage would probably limit it. Voltage would limit the physical ability to provide the required voltage. To the motor is what limits it. If in theoretically there is no limit, in practice, the H bridge has a limited voltage. Let's say 24 volts as input. Our duty cycle here can only go from zero to one. If you have a KP here that is extremely high, what happens? It will just saturate the system your duty cycle will reach one very fast and will just stay at one so long as the system is saturated because it can't, if you go higher than one, you apply 24 volts. Uh, anything between zero and one, it's now the average voltage will be proportional to that duty cycle. But anything greater than one, it's 24 volts. It can go beyond 24 volts. So that's what limits the upper, um, limits the, um, the value of KP. Okay. And the same, uh, the same thing could be said for the other values in the controller as well. If they are too high, when you have a small error, then your duty cycle will jump to, un, to, to one and everything becomes saturated. So you need to be very conservative with respect to these gains here to map them properly from zero to one. Now let's look at proportional integral controller. So if proportional is one, derivative is zero, and integral goes to 10. What do we see here? 
we see an improvement at low frequencies. Uh, the higher frequency, it has no major effect. We can see that there is some overshoot as we start to increase the gain, we'll break away from the real axis and the system will now start to oscillate. But the good news is the root locus never crosses into the unstable region and the system appears to be closed loop stable as well. And a PD controller, we have proportional to one, KI0 and KD to 0 0.1. What you see here, we see now an improvement at high frequencies. We added a zero to the system at low frequencies in this particular example. And now we see an improvement in the open loop, in the closed loop response compared to the open loop. You see now how the body plot increases magnitude at high frequencies. So this could be a good way to get a wider range of frequencies for operation. What can we conclude here as well? The, uh, that a very high control gains can lead to overshoots. Very high control gains will lead to overshoot. If you look at the root locus, we are coming, going to the zero. So we are coming this way and looping towards the zeros like that. So for low gains, no overshoot. For high gains, we have this region where some overshoot may occur. And then we tend to the zeros back to no overshoot. But this again only applies to these specific scenarios. This might change completely if your motor parameters are different. And we can also say that the system is stable. All right, so something we just talked about is the effect of, uh, let me skip a few slides here. I'll come back there. I just want to link this with what we just discussed. We are talking about saturation. And if you have saturation, then you're going to run into this issue with integrator uh, windup. This becomes a, a problem, especially when you, well, when you have an integral, because you're now taking the integral of an error that it doesn't change over time. If the system becomes saturated, we are taking the integral of an error and you're actually adding more effort to that controller. And the system is saturated and can react to that amount of extra uh, a control effort that we want to provide. So this is where the effect of integrator wind up arises. So let's assume, for example, here, that is the same example we had before. We had a power amplifier that runs at 24 volts. So negative 24 to 24 volts. Well, let's assume that one of our control gains here is too high. So if it is too high, it will immediately get a small error. And then that small error will be multiplied by all these gains that will go to a duty cycle of one. A duty cycle of one gives a 24 volt output. The motor doesn't have enough time to respond to, to that. So as we start, it starts to move, the error is still saturated. And as the motor, it, stay, it takes its time to respond to that command, the error may decrease a little bit in the process, but it still we have control gains that are too high. So we'll keep integrating that giant that error and we create a saturated control output. We are now storing that information in the integrator because that's what the problem with the integrator. We are looking at the past history of error and you're integrating it. So we have an, an error that reaches a very high number and when you pass that through the controller, we have always the same number. So the motor is not responding to that because you're not changing our control input, but you're keeping integrating the error and building that up. And as we build that up in the memory of the system, we later need to kind of release, not kind of, we need to release that stored control effort through the controller, which means that the saturation will occur for longer now because of the integrator. And that's where the problem with overshoot and integrator wind up arises. Let's see here two examples, is speed and, uh, and uh, is speed control with, without saturation. Let's assume that hypothetically we would get this response. If now the system becomes saturated, it has a saturation limit, we'll see a lot of uh, overshoots happening in the beginning because the system is saturated and because the integrator integrated the air in a saturated state and stored all this amount of energy in the controller before it releases everything to the plant and hence the effect of integrator wind up right and hence this overshoot from integrator wind up 
So be conservative with your gains because it doesn't matter uh, if we want to go beyond one 100% duty cycle, the system cannot respond to that, right? So if the system is not responding to our commands, there is no point in keeping integrating an error that it now doesn't really represent the dynamics of the system because the system is again saturated. What is the problem, the, the solution to this problem? Well, turn off the integrator if the system becomes saturated. So here is a simple solution if you're using a microcontroller. We have the motor, we're doing torque, speed, position control, whatever we, we, we are dealing with. Here is the input to the motor, the voltage, which is the output of this big controller. And that's the controller implemented in a microcontroller. We are measuring the output, sampling that output with a sampling rate T or at a frequency one over T. And then comparing that with a desired input to create this error. We pass this error through the proportional, the integral and the derivative parts. We see the proportional part here, the error multiplies by KP and is added to the control effort. We see the error here being passed by the, the uh, derivative and through the integrator. Let's see how the derivative is calculated here. We have the current error, the past error, and we divided that by the period. Multiply that by KD, that's the derivative part. Let's see what, how the integral is calculated. We have this variable that accumulates the error. Error at instant i is the error at instant i plus The, uh, oh, sorry, error at iteration i is error at iteration i plus the period times the current error. So we are keep, we're basically summing the error that occurs, but as we sum it, we remember we need to multiply that by the period because you're looking at the area under the graph. That multiplies by ki and that gives the integral part. Now, how can you check if the system is saturated? Well, we can look at the output here and if the output becomes greater than the maximum value we can actually apply to the system, the system is saturated. And if that is the case, then turn off the integral gain. Uh, if this condition is not met, then go ahead and connect the integral gain. If the system is saturated, simply do not connect the integral gain or send that to zero, which means that this value here will tend to zero now. And what we, in the integrator, we are just we just stopped accumulating the area. We see that the uh, at every iteration that value doesn't change. And as you flip the switch back to no, then now e uh, k is non-zero, and that it starts to integrate again. Now it's a simple way to implement this in a microcontroller. If your system is saturated, do not apply. Do, stop integrating. And if the system is not applied, is not saturated, then continue the integration. Any questions here? No? Okay. And the last topic that I wanted to mention is the uh, tuning. And this is just a reminder from control systems. So uh, I, I think we can skip this. Two ways to tune a PID controller. The first one, we have to bring the system to the to instability, calculate the ultimate period, the ultimate uh, uh, gain, and then you have this table where they are, these values are implemented to determine KP, KD, and KI. Right? And method one. Method number two, we approximate this, the response of the system with this first order transfer function. We have to determine the slope the race time and so on. And once you have this, we can also use another chart to tune the PID controller. So I'm going to skip this. I think it's relatively fresh and there's really nothing much here. The, all we need to do is identify these parameters from the open loop, open loop step response of the model. Okay, any, any questions before we do some exercises? No. Oh.
No questions? All right, so let's do a few exercises. Let's just start with exercise 70. We have a Maxon RE40 DC motor with the following characteristics. Same one that we used in the last lecture. Torque, speed constant, resistance, inductance, inertia, and friction. Determine the stall torque and the developed torque and the speed when the input power is 100 watts, uh, the electrical input power, and the load torque is 0 0.1 Newton meters. Okay, so let's just start with the stall torque. What is the stall torque for this motor? What is the stall torque for this motor? How do you calculate the stall torque? When speed is zero. When the speed is zero, that's where we get the stall torque. So what is the current when the speed is zero? In the steady state, current remember is V minus E over R. If the if the voltage, if the speed is zero, E is zero. We have V over R. That's the stall current. What is the stall torque? If that's the stall current, what is the stall torque? Ki times the current. Ki, exactly, times the current. So the stall torque is V is, uh, is a given here. V is the input voltage, which uh, is not given. So let's give it 24 volts, I believe. Uh, that's the information that is missing. For this motor is 24 volts. So that is 24 divided by 0 0.3. Here, see how small the resistance is times the torque constant, which is 32 times 10 to the power of negative three. And this gives 2.56 Newton meters. Okay, so this is quite impressive for a small motor. So this motor has a diameter of 40 millimeters and it has a torque of 2.56 Newton meters as stall torque. So if you put a rod of one meter and you put a two kilograms at the top at the end, this motor should be able to hold it. That's quite impressive. But again, this is the stall torque. It's not the nominal torque. It cannot be sustained for a long period of time. So what A is done, let's do B, the developed torque and speed when the input power is 100 watts. The developed torque and the speed, so the torque and the speed when the input power, the input power is 100 watts. This input power is the electrical power. How do you define the electrical power in the motor? That's P times, that is V times V times I, from which now we have the power, we can define the voltage, the input voltage required to do that. We don't have control over I, you know, we have control over uh, V. So V is simply power 100 divided by the current. Now you're interested in the developed torque and the speed for that condition. How can you solve this? Well, first we will need to find, find the current to apply, uh, to, to develop this much voltage. And we are driving a load torque of 0 0.1 Newton meters. So load torque is 0 0.1 Newton meters. From here, and from this information, we should be able to find the current itself. What is the voltage? Uh, what is the relation between the torque and voltage? Well, we can use the other equation. The other equation we had for the torque, we know that the torque is equal to Ki Vb plus Ki Td. All these Ks are, remember that a Ki equals to Km for this motor. So I just write K here to avoid confusion. And this is divided by Ki times Km, so K squared plus Rb. All right, so what, what do you have here? We have a torque input. 
of 0 0.1 newton meters. We have torque here. We have voltage. Voltage is a function of the current. So is the torque. Right, so if you want to use this equation to, the, to infer the current, we can replace V with 100 over I. And you can convert this equation back into from torque to current. How do we do that? How do we rewrite this expression to have the current there? You can simply divide both sides by K. Right, this is the current constant. So if you divide both sides of this equation by K, this K disappeared, T over K is I. Right. So the current becomes VB plus KTD over K squared plus RB. All right, just dividing both sides of the equation by K. Torque divided by K equals to I. All right, so I equals to torque over KI. Now we have current here. We have voltage that we can relate to current and everything else is known. So from this, we can solve for the current. So we have the current times K squared, which is 32 times 10 to the power of negative three squared plus R 0 0.3 plus B that's 10 to the power of negative five equals to V, which is 100 over I times B plus K 32 times 10 to the power of negative three times TD, the load torque we are driving. And that is 0 0.1 Newton meters. We know everything here, but we don't know I. So now this will become a second order uh, equation. We multiply both sides by I and we rearrange for I. A simple math step. This will give 0 0.032 I all squared minus 0 0.032 I minus 0 0.001 equals to zero. I'm simply rearranging the top equation. And this is a quadratic equation. I no need to solve this. So this gives us the current as 3.4 amps. 3.4 amps. That's the required current to drive this load when the input voltage, the input power is that. What is the voltage itself? Well, the voltage is given there is 100 divided by I that we just calculated here, which gives 29.4 volts. It's supposed to be a number four. What is the speed? Now we have the voltage. How do you calculate the speed? How do you calculate the speed? Uh, torque is equal to WB. WV? Uh, WB. The, the, yeah, the friction times the speed. Friction times the speed. Yep, yeah, we could do that. We have the, the torque developed now. Uh, so we would need... Okay, okay, I see. So we could do it in, in two ways. We can take the load torque we can take the torque developed in the motor, right? And the torque developed in the motor will be the load torque plus friction right? from which we can infer the uh, the speed that will make that, that balance. Or you can just use, that's one way. Or we can simply use that equation, which is uh, just another way to say the, say the same thing. K times V minus R disturbance torque divided by K squared plus RB. Right, we know everything here. We know all these parameters. This is the voltage we calculated. This is 0.1, right, the load torque here. And if you replace everything here, this gives 887 
radians per second with all the parameters we currently we currently have and the torque deployed by uh, the motor is k times i which is i 3.4 and k is 32 times 10 to the power of negative 3 this is 0 0.1088 newton meters okay 0 0.188 newton meter so this is the torque developed in the motor notice that we, we are driving 0 0.1 newton meters but the torque developed in the motor corresponds to 0 0.1088 newton meters why are they different uh, friction friction exactly friction and that is uh also answers the previous comment i i got another way to calculate this the, the speed would be to balance the torque so we have the torque developed here in the motor would be the load torque right, plus the effect of friction omega b right, and there's another way you can could calculate the uh, speed and this gives this torque here the effect of load torque plus the effect of friction so to drive this load at 0 0.1 newton meters at this speed, this speed will generate friction. So this times B is the additional frictional torque that we need to account for. Okay. Any any questions? Any questions here? No. All clear all right so if there are no questions i'll move on sure no questions don't be afraid to ask questions if something is not it's not clear it's probably because i didn't explain it properly so ask questions very well then if there are no questions we'll move on Let's do exercise Let's do exercise 73 that one. The DC motor of exercise 70, so the one we just used is to be used to control the position of the 0 0.25 kilogram mass as shown. The mass is connected to the to a motor using a pulley belt mechanism. Each pulley has a radius of 250 millimeters and the coefficient of viscous friction between the, the mass and the plane there is 0 0.1 Newton second per meter. Determine the required electrical power to drive the mass, to move the mass at a constant speed of 500 millimeters per second. Determine the required electrical power to drive the mass at 500 millimeters per second. All right, so I'll let you think about that as I erase the, the whiteboard. How can we calculate now the required electrical power? So if we are driving the mass at a constant speed of 500 millimeters per second, then we can, we can neglect the effects of inertia because it's a constant speed. So the effects of acceleration, the force to accelerate the mass is gone. So what is opposing motion or what is creating, what, what torque do we need to drive with the motor basically in this condition? There is only one torque to be overcome. And what is it? What is the, uh, so the motor applies a torque. What is that torque doing? Where is, where is that torque going? Um, against the friction of the pulley. The friction of the pulley or, or the mass here, yeah, represented by the coefficient of viscous friction, Bm. Okay, so, and that coefficient is one Newton second per meter. All right. 
So let's do that example. There you go. Okay, so here is our system and we want to drive this mass at 500 millimeters per second. We have a motor right there, the motor rotates and as it rotates, the mass translates. There's friction here between the mass and the plane. All right, so what do we do? If you want to develop the, the calculate the electrical power required to move the mass at that speed, what do you need to determine first? Tell me what to do here. We know the linear speed of the mass, 500 millimeters per second. We can easily calculate the required speed in the motor side. Right? We can easily calculate the speed from the, for the motor. What else we need to calculate to determine the electrical power in the motor? Torque. Torque. The torque. The torque, exactly. We need the torque. So we first need the speed and the torque that the motor will operate at. So what is? let's start with the torque. If this mass is moving, it is moving with a speed V. And there is a friction between the mass and the ground here. So this friction creates a force pointing in the other, in the other direction. And what is the magnitude of this friction is B times V. My coefficient of viscous friction, one times V, the speed of the mass. So the first thing here is the force developed in the mass. The force is B times V. B is one Newton second per meter. And the speed is 500 millimeters per second, which is 0 0.5 meters per second. All right, times 0 0.5 meters per second. So second cancel second, Newtons cancel Newtons, and we have 0 0.5 Newtons as the force that opposes motion here at that specific speed. Because this is going at a constant speed, then the effect of effects of acceleration can be neglected. What is the torque developed in the motor now? That's the force on the mass. And so this is the force we need to apply to move it in the other direction at a constant speed. What is the force develop, torque developing the motor? Is it the force times the radius of the pulley? Exactly, the force times the radius of the pulley, which gives 0 0.5 times the radius of the pulley is 0 0.25 meters. And this gives 0 0.125 Newton meters. So that's the torque the motor needs to develop. What is the speed of the motor now? Well, the speed we need to, to convert now this translational speed to rotational speed. And you know that the linear speed is the angular speed times the radius of the, <clears throat> the pulley R. So omega equals to V over R, V is 500 millimeters per second, 0 0.5 meters per second, divided by R, the pulley radius, 0 0.25. And this gives two radians per second. Now we can calculate the speed sorry, from the speed specification and from the torque specification, we can calculate the voltage and the current in the motor. And then from that, we can infer the electrical power input. So we can use omega equals to KV minus R TD divided by K squared plus RB to find the voltage. Omega is 0 0.5. K is 32 times 10 to the power of negative three. V is what you want to calculate. R is the resistance, 0 0.3. TD is the load torque 
zero point one twenty five K square minus plus R zero point three times ten to the power of negative five. We solve for V. This is one point twenty three volts. And to find the current, what do, we, what do we do? To find the current, we can use that other expression for the DC motor, or let's take a shortcut this time. How do you calculate the current? Current would be the developed torque plus friction. Here, the only torque is created from friction. So if you know the frictional torque, we know the current. So what is the current here? What is the current? Is it just V over R? V over R. It's not just V over R because the motor rotates. Right? The motor is rotating. So it would be V minus K omega divided by R. Right? K omega is E is not zero. But there is even uh, this uh, even easier way to calculate this. We can simply do the current as the torque developed by divided by the torque constant because the only torque we are we know the only torque in the system the only torque in the system is from friction there's nothing else uh, this this load torque is actually coming from friction so we can easily say that this torque here is 0 0.125 there is nothing else actually on the system and this is now an easy way to calculate the current here is 3.9 amps. So what is the electrical power? Is I times V, which is 3.9 times 1.23. And this gives approximately five watts. Five watts. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. How come we don't consider the B value of the motor itself for like friction? The shaft of the motor? Yeah, because it said it's using the same motor from exercise 70 and that gave us a viscous friction value. How come we don't consider that? Oh, we can consider that. Yeah, yeah, we, that's a good point. We can consider that. The reason I'm not considering it here is that it's 10 to the power of negative five. It's very, very small. And you're going at two radians per second. But that's a fair point. Let's do that. Let's calculate that instead. So what would be the equation for it? We need the big equation again. So that would be T equals to KVB plus KTD divided by k squared plus rb. So I, sh I shouldn't have said that the only torque acting on the system is this one, because you're right. There, there's also the one acting from b. Uh, this is the motor is not this viscous friction. But b is 10 to the power of negative five. And the, volt, the speed here is two radians per second. Uh, it's not a significant speed. So you're going to get something in the order of 10 to the power of negative four Newton meters. Compared to this, it's negligible. But you, you are right. This is a, uh, the more accurate way to calculate the current. Divide both sides by Ki. We calculate the current that now, now accounts for both, accounts for this, and accounts for friction as well. Question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we could also find, uh, <clears throat> could we also find torque using uh, T plus WB? T plus, yes, we could do that, yeah, yeah. So 0 0.125 plus WB, yeah, yeah. So T would be load torque plus B omega, load torque 0 0.125 plus B, 10 to the power of negative five times omega two. So this is approximately 0 0.125. This is 10 to the power of negative four. Our 0 
that works as well. Okay, and then we have another example here. I would let this one for you to try later. This is a static case where you want to displace the mass by a certain amount. There is now a spring connected to the mass. Yeah. And you need to determine the voltage that is required at the motor side to move the mass by a certain amount. So I'll let the, you try that one. Let's do a quick quiz. And then um, I will uh, maybe, if we have time, I will solve one more exercise later, just for the record. Uh, just to say that in the next lecture, we're going to start studying AC machines and we'll shift the focus from DC to all AC until lecture 20, where uh, we just do some transient analysis, but most of the remaining remaining of the course will be based on DC machine, AC machines, okay? So we're going to stop here today. I have office hours starting at 10. And uh, if uh, I notice that all office hours are booked for today, and I think Thursday is a bit busy as well. If you need extra, uh, an extra time, or if you need to arrange a time outside of office hours, just email me, okay? Have a good day. We'll see you again on Thursday.